So, as you may know, my name is Melanie During, and I'm an undergrad student from the University of Amsterdam. I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself first. <laughs> I've been a rock and fossil collector for as long as I can remember. I don't know where, when it started. I know everybody was always annoyed when we went on a trip, and I would, my dad would have to carry my bag, and he'd be like, what did you put in here? Yeah, I wanted to bring everything. Eventually I had to get rid of something, but... I'm a neuroscientist, that's my basic bachelor's. Uh, I've always had the interest for, for rocks and everything inside rocks, from fossil fuels to fossil um, organisms. So I just started to go more into that direction. I tried to earn a little extra money by being a model, but I'm too short. <laughs> so I'm crazy enough to put a trilobite on my foot. <laughs> So, and, and I did this summer, I went with uh, John Fuss on a Pleistocenic uh, fishing trip. And like you, you fish for uh, crabs, we fished for bones. And we found this very pretty thigh bone of a woolly rhino. Which I had to hold because it ma I made it look bigger. <laughs> That's my first ever found trilobite. So, very proud of that one, even though it's not much. So, my goal in life, I'd like to think beyond a career. I, I actually want to make a difference, and not necessarily like in the political way or in the, uh, yeah, not the general way. I, I think we lack knowledge in this world, and I'd like to contribute by contribute spreading this knowledge. And I know that big history actually offers a, such a great insight and has such an impact on people, and it really motivates people. So I'd like to use that tool. Actually, I think I see it as a tool almost for a general perspective, and I'd like to be a professional paleontologist. Um, well, geology and big history is what I'd like to discuss. I think that geology has such a dominant position in life, but I can hardly ever find it in literature. People consider geology uh, like they hardly ever consider it. It's, it's beyond our grasp, and so we never mention it, but it has such a dramatic influence on us and on the previous organisms that roamed this world. You see, our Earth is more than a surface. It's not a steady, stable thing. It is in motion, and it will always be in motion, at least for as long as we are here. So we should consider it a bit more, and especially when it comes to when we look in the past and, and the, the species that have gone extinct or have uh, evolved differently, I think that geology has had a massive impact in that. It, it affects all spheres, the biosphere, the atmosphere, everything we see and know is affected by geology. So I'm going to discuss a geological example, but I know not everybody here is a geologist, so I'm going to make a little human example to see how I think geology, or let's say a situation, can make an organism change its path, a species change its path in life. So, I come from pretty much non-Goldilocks circumstances. I had a pretty not so bright upbringing, you can say. I come from a divorced family, not a very convenient situation, and we were very, very poor, which meant that if something broke, you couldn't get, you couldn't get someone to fix it. So you'd have to learn how to fix it yourself, or you'd have to find something else. So I came, became a bit creative in solving my own problems, and eventually, since the niches that were there weren't so convenient, I started looking for other niches I could fill. And I do that now, and I have no issues so far, so it's going, going pretty good so far. And um, I'd like to mention three geological examples in, through three very different timescales. I want to discuss the trilobite extinction, the dinosaur aviation, I'm not going to discuss the physical manner in how they did that. It's dangerous territory. And I'm going to discuss island evolution. Trilobites were, as you may know, one of the first complex organisms that roamed this earth. They've been on this earth for a stunning 291 million year, years. Almost no species have done that long. It's truly remarkable. And they're, I think, the most common found fossils on this earth, so I'm maybe proud of my little trilobite, but it's not much, actually. 
in your mix? Yeah. They filled various niches. They were scavengers, they hunt prey, they were hunted, they swam, they crawled the seafloor, they were in the in the shallow oceans, but they're in the deeper oceans. So actually they were they were quite as stable actually as a, as a global species. You you don't expect anything to just wipe them out because they had they were very strong and they were very present. <coughs> They were here on Earth from the Cambrian explosion of life until the Permian extinction. And as you can see from the paleogeography, there's been quite some changes during that time. And I'm just going to note real quickly here, as you can see, there are quite a lot of shallow oceans. We had various different continents, so there were quite a lot of shallow oceans. However, when Pangea was formed, that changed dramatically. We had one major continent, kind of like a small little ocean in there, and an enormous ocean. So the, the, the shallow oceans that go around this, the, it was a, a way smaller surface than they were used to and accustomed to. But this actually didn't matter that much, because like I said, they also filled the niches in the deeper oceans. So what did matter then? Well, if all the continents are moving, you're going to get massive volcanic activity. And that meant that we had a uh, hydrogen sulfide gas vent in the ocean floors that actually um, acidified our oceans. And trilobites made their skeletons out of calcareous material. So that doesn't respond very well to a lowering of the pH of the water they swam in. So they started to be a unable to build their own skeletons. Yeah, that pretty much means a lot for an organism. Um, so their, their Goldilocks circumstances almost literally vanished. And you can see in various lakes throughout the US, or ancient lakes, I'd like to say, throughout the US and throughout other continents, you can just find heaps and heaps of trilobites because it dried up or got uh, <coughs> or acidified and they just couldn't <coughs> live there anymore. My second example is actually is, is dinosaur aviation. And I'm going to say this very honestly, it needs much more research, and I'm discussing an idea, so don't expect me to know everything about it. I honestly, I've read a lot, but I know there's more. Um, as we know, I just mentioned, Pangaea had a large land mass, and they pretty much roamed Pangaea during the Mesozoic era. So we had a lot of big reptiles on a big continent. So in order to compete with each other, they, they developed various features. Hard, uh, tough skin, uh, large teeth, uh, enormous claws, uh, speed, anything. So they, they had a lot of niches and they were filled quite easily. However, there are niches enough in the sky. So I'm thinking that throughout big history, it actually, I think that that was a niche that makes a lot of sense to want to fill. I don't know if they started jumping to fly, if they started gliding to fly, if they fell down and started flying, they flew. <laughs> I'm not going to go into that maybe one day, hopefully one day, because that's what I want to do, but I'm undergrad. <laughs> Next. Uh, the third, the third uh, remarkable geological uh, phenomenon I find are island species. An isolated area, lack of enemies, lack of natural predators, and, and plenty of food. So the, the larger mammals, they didn't have to put all their energy into their size anymore because no one was hunting them, no one was challenging them. So they could use their energy for their existence and not just their size. And the, the, the rats, the small little mammals, they weren't hunted anymore, so they didn't need to hide and, and crawl away anymore. So there, there were actually new niches, not, not necessarily just open niches, but they were very, very different from what that organism was used to. So they, they shrunk or they grew. I don't know if you know that picture. It's a very famous picture to what I know. That is an adult elephant skeleton with a 10-year-old boy next to it. 
So that was the size of elephants and that was the size of horses that they have found there. They were this tall. I can hardly imagine that, but they found that. And this is the head of a rat. This, this is the normal size skeleton, the head of a, uh, the skull of a rat. And this is one they have found, I think, in Sicily. So they grew because they could. Like I dye my hair because I can. <laughs> Next one. And then they found humans. And apparently we aren't mammals because that was a shocker. Because everything applies to every animal there is, except for humans. Now, they were children. Everything in their bones tells us that were, they were adults. But this, this is dangerous territory to say that we are mammals. So, I'll just say it. We're mammals. Um, I just want to spend some time doing this, because I've never been at a conference before. I'm incredibly shy, even though I have a very big mouth. <laughs> I'd like... <laughs> it's a very good cover. <laughs> However, I, I really want to thank Fred and Esther for seeing something in me, for having plenty of discussions with me on various subjects throughout this time scale. Um, I'd like to thank Jonathan Markley, he can't be here, he has to chair a different panel, but he gave a phenomenal uh, lecture in our course about the, uh, from a grass perspective, which actually enabled me to let go of the human perspective. Because I was like, yeah, well, geology involves us like this, and geology involves us like that. No, geology just, just does that, unconsciously does that. Finally getting able to let go. I don't know if you know him, but John Voss, I consider him a famous paleontologist in the Netherlands. He's retiring. And he practically, after his first lecture, I asked him three or four questions and he was like, why don't we make an appointment? So he, we did that and I got a couple of private tours through, through the muse museum and he took me on the boat and we went fishing for fossils. And he just told me, you know what, if you want to do paleontology and geology, do it. No matter what people tell you about the job market, that is your interest, do it. And so I did. And I would like to thank, yeah, this sounds a bit, oh well, my boyfriend, Thomas Decker, for making the artwork, also on the cards that I handed out. He's a very good artist, and I just, yeah, he should get some credit, too. Uh, like I expected, I cannot fill 20 minutes. I'm very sorry.